Okay, let's get going. So hi, my name is Ryuji, and we're gonna talk about effective communication for content creators and educators. So my goal with this presentation today is to help you better communicate whatever it is that you communicate. I personally work in the space where I communicate mainly to a general audience, and I talk about topics that are related to animal ethics. However, I think that the content that I'll talk about will help you no matter what you're trying to communicate and no matter who you're trying to communicate to. So, a little bit about me, 30 second introduction, I make videos. And those videos have two purposes. One is to show that animals are individuals, no matter what species they are, whether they're a fish, a chicken, a cow, a pig, a turkey, they're an individual who feels, thinks, and suffers. And the second thing is to show that they suffer a lot more than we typically imagine. Throughout my years of doing this work, I've worked with several organizations, including these ones, and in 2022, my videos did 31 million views. Now, I'm not saying, thank you. Now, I'm not saying this to brag, but rather to show that this is something that, it's, it's, it's not like a skill that I had when I was born out the womb. I didn't just come out of my mother and was like, I know how to make great videos. It's something that I learned over many, many years. In fact, this is actually a screen grab from the first video that I ever made in 2008. I did these weird card tricks and made videos about them. It's pretty weird. Anyways, fast forward to today, I was able to make content, videos on social media that eventually got me some national attention in the US. And uh, that was, thank you. It was a really long journey, but the point I'm trying to make here is that throughout all these years, I learned this, this set of skills that when you apply, will make you a better communicator and will make you be able to create uh, better content or do whatever it is that, that you're doing. So let's get straight into it. As communicators who are trying to talk about animal issues, we have this problem, or problems plural, but we, we have this big problem, and here it is. If you were to think about the ideal topic to do education around, that topic would have these characteristics. It would be fun, it would be not polarizing, and it'd be something that people want to think about. So think about science, for example. Now, science is kind of fun. And think about when you were a kid and you went to school and you did this thing where you built this volcano. That's pretty cool. So if you're an educator, this is the kind of thing you want to talk about. You want to be like, hey, I'm going to talk to you guys about how to make a volcano. It's pretty cool. Why? Because it's fun. It's not polarizing. It's not like anyone's going to get mad because you explain how volcanoes work. And it's something you kind of wonder, right? Like, how do volcanoes work? I wonder. That's kind of interesting. On the other hand, what we're trying to talk about is not fun. It's pretty polarizing. And it's also something that people don't want to think about. Now, if you think about what we're saying to people, we're basically saying, hey, are you aware that there are these, these animals? In all the ways that matter, they're just like dogs and cats. And they suffer, like, a lot like way more than you can imagine. And by the way, it's kind of your fault. It's pretty tough to communicate that. So the question is, how do we take this polarizing topic and communicate it in a way that's engaging? And in order to do that, we must think about one of my favorite things in the world, and that is love. Now, when you have two sentient beings who are in love and look very cute, like this, there is a term that we use to describe them. That term is item. We say they're an item. Actually, probably no one says that, but stick with me for a second. So we say they're an item. You're like, where, where is this going, Ryuji? Well, the reason why this is important is because what you want to create with your work is you want your work and your audience to become an item. And how do you do this? You do this using this. Oh look, it's a cool acronym with the word item. And these are the characteristics of content that will be engaging and easy to understand and memorable for the audience that you're trying to communicate to. Now item has these four characteristics. The first one is interesting, the second one is trustworthy, the third one is easy to understand, and the fourth one is memorable. I'm gonna go through each of these uh, separately, 
and give you a ton of examples so that this actually makes sense. Now, even though it's in this order, I'm actually not gonna go in this, I'm gonna start with easy to understand. And there's a reason why. The reason why I'm starting with easy to understand is because this is key when you try to communicate with people. I remember when I was in high school, and I, I was like teacher's pet, so I was always like a really good student, and the teacher would sometimes ask questions about, you know, whatever. And I would always raise my hand and answer, and I thought I was really smart at the time, because I would, I would answer with these long sentences and these complicated words, and I was like, oh, I must sound so smart. But actually, the hallmark of a great communicator is not to use complicated sentences and big words, but it's to be able to explain things that are, could be very complicated, but in a very simple way with easy words. So, how do you do this? The first thing you must do is assume no prior knowledge. When you communicate to people, you want to assume that they don't know what you know. Why would they know what, they, what, what you know? They've lived a different life to you, they're a different person. So it's unreasonable to assume that they necessarily have prior knowledge on the topic that you're talking to them about. So for example, in the, in the context of animal advocacy, if I have a conversation with people, I'm not gonna assume that they just happen to know what happens in the egg industry or anything like that. I'm gonna assume, hey, you've lived a different life from me, you probably don't know what I know, and I'll start explaining everything as if they have no prior knowledge. And then, like I said, you wanna use simple, everyday words, and you wanna be specific. So let's get into examples to make this make sense. So imagine you wanna say something like, animals are sentient regardless of species. One way that you could apply everything that I just talked about is to say something along the lines of, whether an animal is a fish in the ocean, a dog in a two-bedroom apartment, or a chicken in a factory farm, they feel, think, and suffer. So two parts here. Instead of using the word species, which is vague, use something specific that paints a picture. A fish in the ocean, or a dog in a two-bedroom apartment, or a chicken in a factory farm. And then replace sentient, which by the way, I, I realized that you know, we say sentience a lot as, as advocates, and I thought about it one day, and I'm like, I don't think I ever said the word sentient before I started animal advocacy. Like, I'm not sure that, like, I don't, I don't think I knew what that meant. So instead, I replaced that with, they feel, think, and suffer, which for practical purposes means the same thing. Another example, instead of saying animals who are killed for food, we can get more specific and say, Fish, chickens, pigs, and cows who are killed for sushi, fried chicken, and cheeseburgers. Now, let's move on to interesting. What does it mean to make something interesting? One of the most important concepts about this, that I realized that, anyways, one of the most important concepts about this is that being interesting, I think, should be at the center of when you're trying to communicate with people. As advocates who are trying to advocate for a cause that we care about, why do we advocate for this? Why do we advocate for animals? Because we think it's important. When I started advocating, I was like, this is an important issue. There are all these animals who are suffering more than we can imagine. We have to do something about it. That's why we need to talk about it. The problem is that most people don't listen to what you say or don't read what you write because it's important. There might be a segment of the population, maybe more of us here, but in general, people listen to things and read things and consume things because it's interesting. And if you want to understand this, think about your own life and think about what you spend the majority of time consuming as content, whether it be videos, uh, like articles that you read, books that you read. Do you read stuff and watch things because they're important or interesting? I would guess that for the majority of us, we spend a lot of time on what we just find interesting. It's kind of fun to watch. That's why I watch it. One phrase that really helped me understand how to implement this is this phrase, people like us do things like this. It's a phrase by Seth Godin. People like us do things like this. This explains what does it mean to make something interesting to someone. And another way of putting this is to say that it makes things, you make things relevant for someone. So people like us do things like this. What does this mean? This means that when you advocate, you start with something that people already care about, something that people are already thinking about, something that is a part of their identity. And you're like, hey, by the way, I know that you already care about all this, 
I know that you already think about all this. And if you care about all this, then maybe you should also care about this as a matter of consistency. Instead of going the route where you say, hey, you should care about this because I'm telling you that it's important. No, it's saying, based on your worldviews, based on your values, based on what you spend your time thinking about, I think you would find this valuable or important or interesting. And then, one of my favorite tricks to make things interesting is to use examples that make points that seem unintuitive seem obvious in retrospect. In other words, to make people think, huh, that's, uh, that's kind of a good point. For example, if you want to say animals have inner lives just like humans, that's a okay statement. Let's try to spice it up a little bit. Okay, it became really long, but stick with me here. Indeed, perhaps, we, perhaps because we, or at least some of us, can write poetry, solve quadratic equations, and debate philosophy, we humans like to think that our experience of the world must be the best, the richest, broadest, and most meaningful experience of the world. This may be true in some aspects, but not necessarily in others. Take the example of perceiving the world through our senses. As it turns out, human senses are embarrassingly dull compared to that of many other animals. Dogs smell better than us, eagles see better than us, and dolphins hear better than us. Could it be that at least in some regard, these animals have a richer experience of the world than us? Another example. If you want to say killing animals for food is not humane because it's not in their best interest. It can turn into something like, euthanizing our companion animals is humane because we do it in their best interest. We do it because they are sick or suffering, and presumably that's what we would want done to us if we were in their position. In contrast, killing animals for food is not humane because we don't do it in their best interest. We do it in our selfish interest. We're not killing them because they're sick or suffering, and that's what we want in their position, but simply because we want to eat a cheeseburger. Next example. The standard legal practices of animal agriculture cause animals immense suffering. If I did to a dog or cat what we routinely and legally do to cows, pigs, and chickens, I wouldn't just get canceled, i get arrested, and for good reason. And last thing, I loaded this thing with example because I think it's the most valuable thing. I hope this is helpful. The circle of life is not necessarily a good thing. Imagine a human goes hiking in the mountains and gets eaten by a bear. Would we throw our hands up in the sky and exclaim, huh, well, the circle of life? No, whenever this happens, we call it a tragedy. Sometimes we even try to punish the bear by giving them a death sentence, as if they should have known better and followed the laws from our criminal code and not the laws of nature. So in all these examples, I took these statements that are kind of vague, kind of like, they're kind of interesting, but I tried to illustrate them with examples that make this point that you would think, oh, that doesn't sound intuitive, like the circle of life is not a good thing, like of course it is. But you paint a picture to, in retrospect, you get people to be like, oh, that was, that was kind of a good point. All right, next point, trustworthy. What does it mean to make something trustworthy? When you talk to people, or when you write something, when you produce something, you don't want to try to convince people of your point of view but rather, you want to try to help them see the world more clearly. In other words, you want to come from a place where you're not saying, hey, I want you to care about this because I care about it or because I think it's important. But rather, hey, would you like to better understand how the world works? Would you like to have a clearer idea of what the world actually looks like? And the benchmark to see whether what you're saying or what you're producing is trustworthy is to ask yourself the question, would I believe what I am saying if I wasn't me? In other words, say you write something, or you say something, or you produce a video, or like whatever. You want to be able to look at that and think from the point, from, not from your point of view, of, of course you believe yourself because you're you, but imagine you're not you, that you don't know who you are, and you're just coming across this thing. Would you actually trust what this thing is saying? Now, how do we do this? One very simple way is to simply explain how you know what you know. Not just say, I know this, but to say, this is why this thing is like this. So for example, a very simple example 
Instead of, we kill north of 80 billion land animals for food every year. We can try something like, according to the FAO, we kill north of 80 billion land animals for food every year. Another example, instead of saying something like, studies show that fish feel pain, you can explain the actual research. Researchers took this number of fish, they did this to them, and they found that they acted like this, and in conclusion, they concluded that these fish probably feel pain. In this example, in the first line, studies show that fish feel pain, this requires the person on the other end to actually trust you as a person, to be like, he actually read the studies and he knows what he's talking about. In the second example, that's no longer required. They still have to trust you to some degree, but if you actually explain how you know what you know, you explain how this conclusion has been come to, people can actually understand that process and come to that conclusion themselves. So they, they need much less trust in you as the speaker in order to actually trust what you're saying. And then, last thing, you want to make things memorable. And how do you do this? You can use slogans and catchphrases. Right? So instead of chickens are sentient, a chicken is a someone, not a something. Someone, not a something is an example of a slogan that I personally like a lot better than sentient. Another one, comparisons and metaphors. One of the ways that we understand things as humans is by comparing things to things that we already understand. So for example, we kill 80 billion land animals for food every year, which is an unimaginably huge number. The problem with this is that 80 billion doesn't mean anything to anyone. But if you say something like, well, we kill 80 billion land animals, that's about 10 times the global human population. Now it makes it a little bit more tangible, a little bit more relatable. Another example, uh, or continuation of that example, that means that in less than two years, we kill more land animals than the number of humans who have ever lived. Or if humans were dying at this rate, we'd be extinct in just over a month. These kinds of ways of picturing numbers is very helpful, specifically with statistics and numbers, especially big numbers, because they don't mean anything to anyone. But if you start putting them in perspective, that can help people grasp the scale or grasp kind of like what you're trying to say. And then examples, examples, examples. I've kind of loaded this whole thing with examples, so hopefully that's kind of like self-explanatory. But the point is that when you say something, what people remember most often is not the actual vague thing that you say, but it's the specific examples you use to actually illustrate your point. So one practice that I do, and I do this like everywhere, whether I'm making a video, writing an article, or talking to someone, if I say something that's a little vague, I'll just force myself to start the next sentence with, for example, and then I'll just give an example. And this will just make everything that you talk about much clearer. So, more examples. Something being natural doesn't mean it's good. Okay, that's a sentence. The next sentence, for example, malaria and earthquakes are natural, we consider them bad. In contrast, bed nets we use to prevent malaria and uh, the seism seismographs, I'm not sure how you pronounce that, seismographs? Seismographs we use to predict earthquakes are bad, but we consider them good. Another examples, animals can solve problems, feel a wide range of complex emotions, and suffer both physically and psychologically. This is actually a kind of example that we like to communicate to people. But put some examples to make it a little more colorful. Tusk fish use tools to crack clams open, Chickens get scared when they hear predators, and cows get distressed when separated from their herds. One of the most valuable skills that you can acquire as a communicator, or content creator, or writer, someone who makes videos, is to honestly ask yourself this question. If I didn't make it, would I watch it anyways? You want to be able to look at your work, not from the point of view of you as the creator, so of course you're attached to your work. You like it because you made it. That's normal. But can you detach yourself and imagine, if I didn't make this, would I still watch it? Would I still enjoy it? One way that you can acquire this is to very consciously think about your experience when you're consuming other people's work. So for example, you're watching videos on social media. You want to think to yourself, 
oh, like say you watch this, you watch this whole video. You want to think to yourself, wait, wait a second, why did I enjoy that video? What was it about this video that was good? On the other hand, if you start watching a video and you immediately skip it, or you start reading an article, you immediately skip it, you want to ask yourself, oh, wait a second, why did I just skip this? What, like, why did I just move past this? And you want to remember that experience. And then you want to apply that same thing to your own work so that you start watching it and you'll, you can become conscious of, oh, I would totally zone out here. Or, oh, this is actually kind of interesting. I would probably keep reading this. So anyways, this is what I want to leave you with. If you can look at your own work, your own words, your own videos, your own articles, not from your point of view, but from the point of view of someone who doesn't even know you, from the point of view of someone who's discovering you for the first time, that is, in my opinion, one of the major, major, major keys to becoming a more effective communicator and making better stuff. So thank you so much, and we have like 20 minutes for questions, so let's do it. Thank you. So very interesting and important to make your message out. Do any of you have questions? I'm going to prioritize someone from the room here. So raise your hand if you want to. Oh. Maybe she could not hear it. And we have it on record, so it might be good for others who miss it to know about your question and his answer. Thank you. Just a short question. Like, how do you deal with negative comments or trolls when you like expose yourself in the public and there are this negativity? How do you deal with that? So there are two elements to this question. One is how do you deal with it like emotionally? And the other one is like how do you deal with it practically? Like emotionally is like it makes you feel kind of bad. Like what do you do about it? And then practically is like do you do you answer? Do you ignore them? Like 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 what do you do? Um, I think in terms of what you do practically, that's that's really kind of like up to you. You can like choose your style. Maybe the more interesting one is like, how do you deal with it emotionally? And to me, a couple of things that help me is to first realize that the negative voices online don't necessarily reflect the majority of people. So just think about this for yourself. How many videos have you watched? How, many, how much stuff have you consumed? And you've loved it. You were like, this was awesome. Like movies that you watched, like TV shows, like videos, like YouTube, like whatever. You were like, this is awesome. And you didn't do anything. Maybe you just gave it a little like. But you didn't leave a comment. You didn't say, this, this is great. I love this. You don't say that. For the vast majority of us, the vast majority of the time, you don't say anything. That's like most people. Most people who see your stuff and like it are not going to say anything because they're not thinking about that, right? In contrast, if people get a really negative reaction, they're much more likely to say something. So just because you see a lot of negative comments, that actually doesn't mean at all that that necessarily reflects the opinion of the majority of people. It could, but you just don't know. So for me, I'm just like, well, it's just some people. I know that some people liked it, some people didn't like it. That, like, that's, that's just how it is. In terms of how to deal with it practically, I, I personally don't engage for this exact reason, which is that I don't think that the people who spend the time to say something so negative or so, and it, like there's, there's like context too, because in a lot of, for example, in a lot of work that I do, I tend to over explain things. I rant a lot, as you can probably tell. And because I rant a lot, and I try to be very thorough with the stuff that I explain, most times I can tell that the people didn't really listen to what I was saying. And I, I don't think they want to listen, which is fine, like that's like their thing. Um, but I don't think that those people are necessarily going to be like historically relevant in the sense that it's like me replying to this person it's probably not going to help that much. I would rather move on to the next thing and try to talk to those people who will be positively affected, who will want to hear what I'm saying, rather than getting caught up with this one random person. Now, the caveat to this is if you have, like, one person who's, like, saying something, and for some reason, like, so this is, like, very specific to social media, but for example, like, say, like, this person's comment gets, like, very highly upvoted, what you can do is write, like, a really well-written, like, kind of, like, counter-argument, like, not in an angry way, but just, like, just kind of like debunk what they're saying. And not for the purposes of that person, but rather for the purposes of everyone else who's going to read that exchange. So you can do that for that particular purpose, but otherwise I don't personally see any point in necessarily engaging too much.
Thank you, Ryuji. I have another question that first and then come to you. But in the meantime, if you have more questions, put it in Hoover. Hi, Ryuji. I wanted to ask you, how would you rephrase this? So this is my, my job. So I work with institutions like school, university, hospitality group, food service company to reduce animal product consumption. And in return, I offer free of charge plant-based culinary training. And my goal is to change the food system for the better. So how would you rephrase this to general public so that it makes sense to them? Um, that's, that's a good question. I think that the biggest question that I, I would ask myself is instead of describing, because well, a lot of what you said is describing what you do. You said, I work with, like, with these types of institutions to do this kind of thing, and I offer this kind of service. I would try to think about um, the end goal, kind of like where, where this is supposed to lead, and maybe, and try a version where you lead with that. So I'm actually not sure that this is the best way, but this is also part of the process of figuring things out. Is, and by the way, like, this is actually a, quite an interesting aside. When I write things, I'll do like many, many drafts of the same thing. So like, I'll, like if you look at my Google Docs for like scripts, they're like, tw like 20, 30 pages long, and it's just like discarded stuff, because I'll rewrite it and rewrite it and rewrite it and rewrite it, because you need to try stuff. But what I would try, the first thing I would try, for example, just to workshop this, is I'll be like, what's, like, what's the end goal? Because you have to think from the perspective of who you're talking to. From, the per from my perspective, say like you're describing what you do, I'm like, well, it's interesting that, that you're doing that. Well, like what does that mean? Like, like what, what does that do? So for example, you can, if your mission is like environmental or like maybe it's like uh, animals, you're like, you know, what, what we do is we reduce the suffering of animals in these industries or like we try to offset like this environmental damage or whatever. And the way that we do that is by doing this. That's like the first thing that I would try. Um, and then like I would workshop from that. But besides like everything that you said, I think like a lot of the words they used were like very simple. There was nothing like complicated to use. So in terms of that, like it seemed pretty good to me. That's just the first idea I would try. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know if that helps, but that's, I would try and see if it's good and then go from there. Thank you, Yuri. Um, I had a question about sharing factory farm footage on social media. Like, how graphic can we go to be effective in your experience? So there, there are multiple, um, what do you call that? There, there are multiple facets through which we could look at this question. One facet is how graphic do we go in order to affect the people who are going to see it? Another question is just something like, how graphic can we go before we literally get like censored by these platforms? Right? So what, what, I, what I found in my experience is that a lot of platforms will censor your stuff if you get like too graphic. Um, so for example, you get like content warnings. Um, on YouTube, you can get like demonetized, like your traffic goes way down. Like that, like that actually happens. Or like, you know, you, you get, yeah, a lot of times you get like age restricted and stuff like that. Um, so I've had that happen to like a lot of my videos where it's like there's like some graphic stuff and it just gets age restricted. So now all of a sudden, like it's not recommended to like a lot of people. People have to like go through this extra step to watch it like is just a pain. So specifically to share on social media, I think that unless there's a really good reason to pass that threshold where it gets censored, I don't think it's worth going through that because it creates so much of a barrier to actually watching what you do. Um, in terms of how graphic you want to be, in terms of what you share with people, the way that I personally think about it is that the more graphic I go, the more context I want to give. And the more I want to explain why is it important for you to watch this, right? So if I want to go like super graphic, like super just like super slaughterhouse graphic, I want to do the best job I can to ex first explain like, okay, like we're going to watch something really graphic. I, I might not say it in this way, but like this is kind of what I'm thinking. We're going to watch something really graphic. So in order for the, like a lot of people, like uh, a relatively large amount of people to watch this, I want to explain why should you watch this. So I might, I might explain things like, I might try to explain, um, you know, animals like cows, chickens, or pigs, or like whoever you're showing, they're just like dogs and cats. They suffer just the same. So that people maybe start to care about them the way that they care about dogs and cats. Um, or I might explain in some other way how this is such an urgent thing. This is happening like right now. 
to millions of animals, um, or you know, like whatever. Um, so that's kind of how I would try to caveat that so it makes it make sense. Um, and also, the other thing that I think a lot about in terms of this is that, so I, I used to show a lot of graphic footage to people like in the streets and ask them about it and stuff like that. And one thing I found very interesting is that people, in my um, experience, often kind of like their, their reaction seemed um, kind of like, um, like underwhelming. Like they were like, oh, this is kind of bad. But I'm like, no, 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 but you don't understand. This is like so horrible. Like, what do you mean this is kind of bad? Like, oh, is that, yeah, it's, I kind of feel bad. Like, what do you, what do you mean? And the, the thought experiment I would always do with myself is I would be like, what if these animals were dogs and cats? Then I realized with stuff that's a lot less graphic, people would already be outraged. Like, just like a dog in the cage, it's like nothing even graphic, and people are already outraged. And like, why is that? It's because people care about dogs so much more than they care about cows, pigs, and chickens. So I think it's crucial that we show the suffering that animals go through because that's how the world is. I think it's important that we try to expose this is how the world actually is. But on the other hand, I also think it's very important that we try to elevate how people think and feel about farm animals so that this makes sense. So for some animals like fish, for example, it's quite typical that you can go the most graphic and people won't care because they don't see fish like that. So if we're gonna show that footage anyways, then I think it's really important that we try to raise kind of like the profile of these animals in people's heads so that they think about them and feel about them a little bit more like um, how they feel and think about uh, dogs and cats. Thank you. We have some question added to Hoover and I'll read in one of them out. Because most of our organizations following is usually a converted or a caring audience. I'm curious to find out if have you have observed what specific kind of your content that gets shared by your followers in their own circles. Uh, so it doesn't stop with liking. Um, yes, yeah, so a, a few thoughts on this. I think that what, like, one of the things that we have to ask ourselves as advocates is like, how do we reach people like outside of our circles? <laughs> and one thing that's very interesting is that you can't like build an audience or build a following of people who are like not like into the thing that you're talking about. Like you can't just like have a page that talks about like animal issues and the people who follow you are just people who are like just not into animal issues. Like that's just not kind of like how things work. So that being said, we have to ask ourselves like, okay, but like then how do we reach these people? And to me, the way that I think about it is I'm like, okay, I have this circle of people. Like this is like the people who follow my work. There are people who are already interested in what I'm doing. A lot of them are vegan, some of them might not be. All of them are interested in animal issues, all of them care about animals, that's why they follow my work. What I want to try to do is I want to try to make stuff that they're gonna watch and they're gonna be like, oh, this is such a great resource, this was so well explained that I wanna share with all my people. Basically, if I make something about a certain topic, say like I make a video about fish, what I wanna do is I wanna make it so that if someone who follows my work goes out and talks to their friends, and they have this conversation about fish. I want them to be, hey, I have the perfect video I wanna send you, and they send my video. That's kinda of how I think about it, and I think that's one of the most reliable ways that we can get to people outside. It might be slower than trying to like grab all these people out here, but if you can get all these people to share a little bit in their communities, in their little circles, I think that's a much more consistent way to go beyond our circles. And it also creates a lot of trust with those people. Because think of like the different level of like how you respect something when it's like you discover it on your own versus like your friend sends it to you. If your friends like certify something, they're like, hey, you should check this thing out. Like, I think you're gonna love this. You'll have like a higher level of respect for that. Um, and the way that you do that specifically, the way that I think about it, is I'm like, okay, so basically in our community, we all have these thoughts, we all have these feelings. We think a lot of this similar stuff. However, for a lot of us, we might have trouble actually putting, like articulating that into words, right? Because we don't like spend a lot of time thinking about it. Now for me, like that's basically my job. Like my, basically my job is to figure out, okay, like all these like thoughts that we have, these feelings that we have about animals, like how do I actually explain this in like these simple words? And so the feeling that I try to create with people is they watch my video and they're like, this is exactly what I think, but it's so well explained. You explained exactly what I was thinking in my head, but like I could never explain it this well. And when you're able to create that feeling with people, 
that's what creates this desire of people to be like, oh, I have to share this. Because they're like, this is so what I'm thinking, and it's so well explained. I need to share this. Um, so, yeah, a bunch of thoughts, but hopefully that answered that question. Yeah. Great. We are running out of time, so I have only one last question. But before I do so, uh, there's so many interesting questions, so many ones who are interested in knowing more about your work and getting playing and maybe get your advice. So can you tell us, like, what's the best way to, like, connect to you and get those questions uh, like to you? Sure. Uh, uh, if, you have a, if you have a question right now, after this, I'll stand like outside or somewhere around there and you can just come see me. And I'll be there as long as like there are people, so like you can just come out to me. And if we have to have a further conversation, we can exchange contacts or something, but um, yeah, let's, let's just yeah. do that for now. Okay, good. Then you go. there you go. One last question, which is, how do you apply this to different cultural contexts? That's a really good question. And one that I'm trying to, it's, it's one that I'm honestly, I'm trying to figure out still. Um, so I think that the, ideally the best way that you would apply this to a specific cultural context is for yourself to be like deeply ingrained within that culture. So, so I'm, I'm gonna give you like examples that are kind of like, they're, they're kind of weird, but like hear me out. So for example, like if I were to advocate for animals, but to people who say, like, love anime. Now, I love anime. And so that's a crowd of people that I'm like, I, I know a lot of the stuff they think, I know how they feel, I know, like, what they like, I know, like, kind of, like, how they think about stuff. And so, like, I'm going to have this intimate knowledge of, like, how to, like, how to, like, talk to them. I'm not actually sure how to articulate that in, in, like, in, like, into words, but the best I can do is to be, like, if you are deeply a part of a culture, then you will have an intuition as to what will work. And it's kind of like similar to the questions I was asking earlier, where you want to ask yourself, okay, like think of yourself not as you, as the person speaking, but think of yourself as a member of this group, a member of this cultural group. Then look at your work and be like, okay, how does this make me feel? Like, and just remove yourself, like imagine that like, you're not an animal advocate, like whoever like your target audience is, imagine that's you, but you're still a part of this cultural group. How does this make me feel? Like, what do I think about this? And then you adjust based on that. If you're trying to do something in a cultural context that you're not totally familiar with, then I think the best thing that you can do, instead of trying to figure out the culture yourself, which can be an interesting thing, but it just takes too long, is more so to work with people who do have this more intimate understanding of what that culture is like. Uh, and just to like ask them. Like, so for example, like, I'm doing work in Japan right now, and even though like, I am like, half Japanese, I never like fully lived in Japan, so there's a lot of cultural things that I lack about like what the culture is like there, which is why I'm working with someone who specifically has a much more intimate understanding of that culture. And even beyond that, like I'm always asking people, like I'll hang out with like random people and I'll be like, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? Like, what do you think about this? Because I'm like, I don't, I just don't trust my own judgment when it comes to this. Um, so, yeah. Thank you very much, Ryuji. That's come to an end of our session. Thank you. Uh, yeah, a lot of great tips there, and I hope that many of our great audience here will, can use some of those in their work. And just a reminder, everyone, Ryuji will have a film in tomorrow night in the AFAT Mini Film Fest. Um, many of his work, what he presented here, will be integrate, integrated in that, in that film. So make yourself available then tomorrow. Uh, the film fest will start at uh, 15 past 8 p.m. So 8.15 in Bronze 5. But it's on, on the agenda. Thank you very much again. Thank you. And now it's a break time.